it's meeting is being minutes. live streamed. Zoom tells me that. God, <laughs> you know, the people who own Zoom must be making so much money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thank you so much for having me. Um, I would say next time in Istanbul, yes. um, you know, I would, you know, COVID willing. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm not going to talk directly about COVID here, um, but everything I say has relevance for how countries have been approaching the pandemic. Um, and the second point I want to make in introduction is that I'm focusing on the United States. That's I'm from the United States and my political and work and my economic work in healthcare has been about the United States. But there are very relevant lessons here um, for the rest of the world, uh, both because American policy has been influential in pushing countries towards a model of healthcare like what we have in the United States. And also because American economics has had great influence. Um, you know, half of our students in our graduate program are from outside the United States. We are fortunate enough to have students from Turkey on a regular basis. Um, and uh, while what we do at UMass is, I think, constructive, um, the people who go from U.S. graduate schools to uh, other U.S. graduate schools out into the world and take this message of free market economics and free market healthcare have been having influence everywhere. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. And if you see what free market policies have done to U.S. healthcare, um, you'll appreciate what's wrong. Okay, problems with US healthcare, cost and quality. I tell people that if they get nothing else out of my talks, they should remember this graph, life expectancy and healthcare spending. For each diamond here represents a country within the OECD. Um, and as you can see, there is a positive relationship between healthcare spending um, shown in logarithms of per capita spending in thousands, um, US dollars purchasing power parity. Um, there's a positive relationship between spending and life expectancy. Some countries do much better. The Japanese spend a little less than other countries and get have the longest life expectancy in the OECD. Um, the United States, however, we spend like mad, I mean, 50% more, remember these are logarithms, 50% more than any other country. Yet our life expectancy in the United States is shorter. And I may add that it was declining for the two years before COVID um, and dropped by another two years since COVID. Um, so these numbers are from like 2016. Um, so the actual situation now is much worse. Um, elsewhere, spending more money buys you more life expectancy, not in the United States. And here we have, you know, this one is cross-sectional. Here we have longitudinal. Going back to 1970, um, countries have been increasing their spending on life, um, on healthcare. Virtually everybody has increased spending on it healthcare per capita. Um, nobody has increased it as fast as the United States. In the United States, we've gone from spending, you know, this is not inflation adjusted, but, you know, under $500 in 1970 per person, we're up to $11,000 per capita, per person. Um, yet, our life expectancy has not increased as fast as countries that have increased their spending at a much slower pace. Um, and this goes back to the 1970s, because back then we were you know, spending a little bit more than other countries and we had life expectancy a little bit less than other countries, but we're still doing pretty well. We, the United States has gotten much 
less effective, much less efficient in its healthcare sector since the 1970s relative to other countries. We've been spending more and more and more, and in fact, since 2014, as I mentioned, our life expectancy, or 2015, our life expectancy hasn't even been increasing, it's been falling. But our spending has soared. Um, here you get the change in spending relative to um, the years of life expectancy gained. We've, since 1971, we've bought additional years of life expectancy at a price of $1,278 per, per, per year. That is 50% more than the next least efficient country. Norway, with all their gas and oil, um, has been buying years of life expectancy at $854 a year. Um, the United Kingdom, they've been buying years of life expectancy at a third our rate. Well, let's go to Canada, you know, a country that a lot of people in the United States forget is independent. Um, Canada has been buying years of life expectancy at less than a third the U.S. cost. You know, most of the OECD is hovering around that $400 mark. You know, Portugal and Spain have done much better. Portugal, by the way, has, a rem has the highest vaccination rate from COVID. Um, uh, over 90%. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have Turkey in here, but uh, uh, Canada, which is right next door, you know, shares radio, television, sports, you know, um, you know, higher education systems with the United States, yet Canada is much more effective at healthcare than the United States and much more effective since 1970. Um, now, why is life expectancy short in the United States? Just jump ahead and I'll come back. But the biggest reason is that so many Americans don't have access. Yeah. Here I have every dime it represents a county in the United States. There are 3,300 or so counties in the United States. Um, there are like 15 in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Texas has a as a 500 or something like a ridiculous number. Um, but for each county, the horizontal axis is the proportion of the population who reports some cost related access problem. That is, they could not do something in healthcare because of cost, because they could not afford the deductible on their health insurance policy, because they could not afford the copay, or perhaps because they didn't have insurance at all and they couldn't afford to go to the doctor. Maybe they couldn't afford to fill a prescription. Um, and the vertical axis is the age adjusted mortality rate in the county. Yeah, so it's not just that some counties have old people you know, who naturally have a higher mortality. This is pre-COVID, this Hello. is a couple of years ago. Just one second, just one second. Yeah. 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 But what you see is a positive relationship. The more people who have problems accessing the healthcare system, the more people who die. The fewer people who have problems, the fewer people die. Now, I've also done this for individual states. And like Massachusetts, we have like the best healthcare system in the United States, the lowest rate without insurance, um, the lowest rate with cost related access problems. But even in Massachusetts, the counties where, where more people have problems, and all of these counties are on the far left side of this line, the counties where people have problems have higher mortality than the counties with fewer problems. Um, okay, now what do economists say about this? Um, and my experience writing about this dates back 30 years or so. But 10 years before that, um, I spent a few years writing about historical demography. And at one seminar um, in 1982, um, uh, Richard Zeckhauser showed up to make a presentation. At that point, Zeckhauser, who had been a health advisor to President Nixon and to President Carter, was out of government. He would go back the next year 
to be health advisor to Ronald Reagan. Um, at the time that he came to our little group, uh, he was head of the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, and he explained that the problem with healthcare in the United States is Americans use too much healthcare because they cannot, they do not pay for healthcare on the margin. And the solution was to reduce the role of insurance so that people would pay more for healthcare when they go to a doctor. Because he said, Americans abuse the healthcare system. Grandma gets lonely. I'm almost directly quoting him. Grandma gets lonely, so she goes and sees the doctor, so she'll have somebody to talk to. I mean, this is obviously contradicted by this and by this, because more people go to the doctor, more people use healthcare, they live longer. So he's dismissing that. And I'm not even going to comment on the gendered uh, misogyny in this. He didn't say grandpa gets lonely. He says grandma gets lonely. Uh, but OK. Um, at another meeting, uh, Martin Feldstein, who shortly after this became head of the Council of Economic Advisors under Reagan, showed up. And he said the same thing. The problem with health care is we abuse the health care system. We go to the doctor too often um, because we don't pay for the health care we receive. Um, now, there's no concern here that if we use the market more, people will face monopoly health care providers. They won't be able to afford doctors or pharmaceuticals because you know, they're thinking about health care like anything else. In fact, they talked about both Zeckhauser and Feldstein did not refer to sick people. They referred to healthcare consumers. Some people, and I'm paraphrasing Zeckhauser, some people go skiing. Other people go to the doctor. <laughs> now, I kind of do both, you know, but whatever. But we don't need to worry about it. How do you know you're not going to be exploited by the ski company? Because if they overcharge, you'll just go to a different company. Or you'll economize. You won't buy skis, you'll buy a snowboard. Or you'll buy a skateboard. Or you'll buy a surfboard. Or you'll get a bicycle. You know, they're subst you substitute. A con consumers are protected by the elasticity of demand for their product. You'll drop a product that costs too much. Consumers are protected by the elasticity of supply. If one ski company charges too much for their skis and is making super profits, another company will come in. And as long as we use the market, producers have an incentive to economize, to innovate, to come up with better ways to make things, to lower the cost of production. Now, when it comes to healthcare, all four of these assumptions that economists bring to their market analysis are wrong. Consumers economize. Consumers don't even know what they need when it comes to health care. And I'm not dismissing people. I'm not saying they're silly or anything. No, it's an elementary problem. It's uncertainty. You don't know what you need now, and you certainly don't know what you're going to need in the future. So what are you going to do? If you don't know what's going to happen, if you don't know what you need, then you will do the rational thing and buy insurance. Yeah. You'll give up something. You'll accept a lower income over time, a lowered expected value of your future income in order to get security. Now, if people are buying insurance, then it's not, you know, it's not going to be the consumer of healthcare who's paying the price on the margin. It's totally rational, totally appropriate in a situation of diminishing marginal utility and uncertainty to buy insurance. But when you do buy insurance, when you're dealing with insurance market, you have a third party payer. And that third party has a different interest than the consumer. The consumer then, yeah, of course, they're not paying the price on the margin. They will try to consume if that's what, how we want to think about healthcare. 
But the other problem is the actual payer has an incentive to prevent you from consuming something that, you know, Feldstein and Zeckhauser don't think about. Protect by elasticity of demand. I was like, come on, you know, what sort of elasticity of demand for healthcare? You know, the elasticity of demand comes in two parts. How much do you need the product? And can you, and, um, can you find somebody else who will give it to you? How much do you need the product? Well, do you want to live or do you want to die? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of absurd to think about that. Um, second, um, can you find the substitute? Another producer of the same product? Well, often you can't because of patent protection, laws, et cetera. But the other thing is, and often you can't because you're not choosing the provider. Your doctor sends you to the hospital. Your doctor chooses the drug. So, yeah. But the other thing is there's a fundamental problem of brand name loyalty. You don't know who's good. So where do you want to go? Do you want to go to some, you know, some street corner doctor? Or do you want to go to Massachusetts General Hospital? Brand name. Yeah. So Mass General, there's a picture of Mass General. Notice all those tall buildings on prime real estate in the West End of Boston. Um, <laughs> Mass General, which now owns 25 other hospitals around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mass General is a gigantic business. It's the largest business in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts now. Um, okay, consumers protected by less supply, the threat of entry. <laughs> what sort of threat of entry? I don't mean to pick on Lowell General Hospital, but I found their insignia is convenient. You know, I mean, I don't know if any of you have been and lived in Massachusetts. Um, but take my word for it. Would you go to Lowell General Hospital, which nobody ever heard of, or would you go to Mass General Hospital, which is the teaching hospital for Harvard University? To say that is to you know, answer the question. Of course you want to go to Mass General. Um, Lowell General or any other new entrant is not an effective competitor. It's to Mass General. There is no contestability here. Um, then you add to that, of course, economies to scale. I mean, look at the scale of Mass General. Skilled labor. I mean, Mass General has, all, has many of the most famous doctors in the United States. Mass General, Johns Hopkins, Yale Memorial Hospital, um, the Cleveland Clinic. I mean, you know, there are half a dozen hospitals. Um, uh, New York Presbyterian, um, my undergraduate institution's medical school hospital, skilled labor. They've, there are only so many elite doctors. Um, brand name loyalty. They may not be any better, but we think they are because they're Harvard. And of course, patent protections. Okay. So now let's say there is competition. Let's say somebody comes in to compete. What do you do? You buy them. <laughs> it's scandalous what's happened in U.S. healthcare. Um, just over the last 20 years, close to 2,000 hospitals, half the hospital system, hospitals in the United States have been bought up by their competitors. Yeah. Um, you get to Massachusetts. In the Boston area, about half the hospital beds are controlled by Mass General now. The hospital sector, when you break it down to regions, because you're not, m most people are not going to go that far for the, um, emer for the healthcare services. You know, it's just not feasible. The ambulance isn't going to take you uh, from Amherst down to New York. Um, at most, it would take you to, you know, Worcester. <laughs> um, 20 miles away, uh, 30 kilometers. Uh, but the hospital sector has become highly concentrated. Most, uh, some, some places are worse than others. Pittsburgh, a good-sized city, uh, an, 
city and surrounding area of about 2 million people, um, has two hospital systems. And both hospital systems own insurance companies that together have about 90% of the market in, in the Pittsburgh area. I mean, that's the extreme, but that's the direction that US, uh, the US hospital system is going in general. And concentration has surprise, surprise been associated with higher prices. Um, the San Francisco area is highly concentrated um, and prices for the same services are about 50% higher than they are in the Los Angeles area within the same state of California, but Los Angeles has a less concentrated hospital sector. And that's the direction we're going. Okay, mergers and acquisitions by drug companies, the same story. Um, a handful of drug companies own um, you know, most of the drug industry. And what happens when somebody comes up with a competing product? You know, not always, but usually it just gets bought up by somebody else. Um, it will be interesting to see. Moderna never had a vaccine before. We'll see what happens, um, whether it breaks into the industry as a major player or if it gets bought up by Pfizer or somebody. Okay, incentives to innovate. Have um, healthcare producers, has the healthcare industry innovated effectively? No, no. Medical care has led the increase in inflation in the United States over the last 20 years. Actually, I could go back to the 19, early 1970s. Um, healthcare inflation in the United States has run at a rate of 1.5% a year faster than in Canada relative to the consumer price index. So the real rate of increase in healthcare prices in Canada has been about 0.1% a year. Uh, Canada, where they have a national health insurance program. In the United States, it's been 1.6% a year. Above, um, just an example for a study in California hospitals. <laughs> Prices just suddenly take off, but not for everything. Prices take off in the private sector, not in the government sector. Medicare and Medicare, Medicare is a public health insurance for the elderly and the disabled, Medic, well, there's Medi-Cal, but that's the Medicaid program, a federal state program of health insurance for the poor. Medicare takes up about 25% of the US population. Medicaid takes up 25% and 40% of the population is covered by private health insurance. About 10% of the population is not covered by any insurance. Um, Prices have soared in California and elsewhere in the private sector, not in the public sector. Medicare in the United States has controlled healthcare inflation as effectively as has the Canadian health system, which is just to tease us, is called Medicare. I tell Americans that the Canadians call their program Medicare just to make fun of people in the United States because our Medicare program is so so much inferior. Why does healthcare cost so much in the United States? Here are links to two articles. Um, one called, It's the Prices Stupid, from about 10 years ago. And three years ago, it's still the prices stupid. US provides fewer resources. Americans don't go to the doctor as often as people in other countries. More American, many Americans are shut out of the system completely. We don't consume more resources. We spend more on healthcare because the prices for healthcare services are so much higher in the United States. Now, back to basics. Uh, one of my teachers from graduate school, Kenneth Arrow. In 1963, he wrote this article, Uncertainty in the Welfare Economics of Medical Care. It is one of the most widely cited articles in the American economics profession. I really wonder how many people ever read the article or if they just throw the link into their um, footnotes. Because I think if people actually read the article, they wouldn't say the things that they say. Um, it's a little bit like the wealth of nations. Um, Adam Smith, S most economists never open the book. Those who do might read the first seven chapters or so. Um, if you actually read the whole book, it's a very different story. 
Um, not to mention if you get to Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments, which he regarded as a more important book. Anyway, Arrow wrote this article, and certainly the Welfare Economics of Medi Medical Care, to argue for national health insurance. And, you know, he starts with some basic, you know, kind of fundamentals here. Healthcare spending is highly price inelastic and highly uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen. And if it happens, you don't know what you should do. So you buy insurance. That creates a third party problem. Arrow talked about adverse selection into health insurance. Insurance companies don't want to insure people who may need insurance. <laughs> they only want to insure people who will never get sick. Economists, you took from this that, oh, we've got a problem of moral hazard where the wrong, where people will get insurance because they expect to get sick and will use the insurance more, will get more health care because they have insurance when health care is free on the margin. Yeah, that's not, Arrow mentions this, but it's not a big part of his story. Um, Patients lack information about treatment. You don't know what you should do. I did not go to medical school. I once had a doctor, you know, shake his head and say, Jerry, you have a doctorate in economics, not medicine. Let me tell you what to do. Um, economists tend to be very arrogant, um, at least American economists. Turkish economists are probably much more modest, sensible, reasonable people. American economists tend to think that they know everything. Um, you know, we have a theory, so that explains everything. Yeah. Um, but Arrow warns that most people don't know what health care they need. They, that creates provider monopolies. There are economies to scale, you know, that giant mass general complex. They're brand monopolies. You know, I mean, you want to go to the doctor with a reputation. Everybody wants to go to that doctor. And so it becomes more expensive. Yeah. What limits the abuse that these monopolists can exercise over us? Collectivity orientation. That's what Arrow called it. I would call it professionalism. You trust your doctor will think about what you need and will not take advantage of the power, the market power that his brand name and his education gives him over us. We trust doctors. Economists say, no, doctors have an incentive to make money for themselves, so we shouldn't trust them. We need to put market restraints on doctors. So the th points in red are what economists took from Arrow. You know, what's Zuckhauser and what Feldstein were telling me you know, 15, 20 years after Arrow wrote, um, by which point Arrow, I think, had left Harvard and gone to Stanford. Yeah. Economists focus on moral hazard, overuse of healthcare. So they don't like insurance, even though, like I said, it's an elementary problem in intro microeconomics that insurance is a good thing. They think doctors are useless because economists think that they're the only ones who know anything. Um, but also they don't trust doctors because, they, oh, doctors will have a monopoly power. They have brand name loyalty. So we need to restrain doctors. You know, they ignore adverse selection, rents, increasing returns, branding, and market power in general. Yeah. Um, if you think moral hazard is the problem, what's the solution? The solution becomes consumer cost sharing, which has... You know, it used to be, just to give you a sense of this, in the early 2000s, the U.S. government does a survey every year of health insurance policies, private health insurance plans, and public ones. But the private ones, the ones that I've been looking at, um, uh, private health insurance plans. Um, and the survey was fairly short. There were like 40 lines in the spreadsheet in 2005. Since then, the spreadsheet has soared. It's more than twice as large, twice as many lines, because they now ask questions about co-pays, 
or how much you pay every time you use the ser a service. Deductibles, how much the deductible is. Because these things hardly existed in the United States. You know, the first time I encountered a copay, it was $5. Now I've got a bill here um, for $60. Patient balance, $60. Yeah. <laughs> um, so deductibles have gone up, copays have gone up. Um, and back in the 1980s, you weren't in most states in the United States, you weren't allowed to have a for profit health insurance company. Now there are virtually no not for profit. All the health insurance in the United States is oriented at, towards making a profit. Increasingly, the Medicare program, healthcare for the elderly, about 40% of the people on Medicare are actually enrolled in for profit health insurance. It's called Medicare Advantage. Um, so, what do these for, how do these for-profit companies make money? They regulate the doctors. They regulate what the health care consumers, to use that word. Um, and they screen, they practice adverse selection. Okay, so guided by the economist, healthcare policy replaces insurance with markets, replaces social insurance with private insurance. The idea of comp market competition empower the insurance over the doctors, eliminate professionalism, undermine professionalism with payment reform, where we're going to give, if you provide less care to the doctors, we will give you some money back. We call those accountable care organizations, ACOs. Um, financial- Mr. Friedman, if you'll forgive me, may yes. I see the slide, three slides back, the one which you had in red, so I can take a screenshot. Oh, okay. I'd be happy to- Share. This one, this one, this one. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd be happy to share my slides afterwards with oh, you guys. Oh, great. I will then write to you. I will then write to you. Right. Right. I'll thank send you. Seema my, uh, uh, my slides. Yeah. Oh, okay. happy, that is happy great. to share. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Undermine professionalism. Okay. Uh, empower insurers over the doctors. Payment reform to undermine professionalism. Um, Undermining professionalism is not an accident. And if you talk to doctors in the United States, uh, there's growing burnout and more doctors are retiring. They feel insulted. Um, one doctor said to me, I have to, to practice medicine now. I have to call some snot-nosed high school graduate in Omaha, Nebraska, and ask him for permission to do what I need needs to be done for my patients. <laughs> yeah. um, supervise the doctors so that they won't overtreat. Uh, okay. Um, as for the insurers, who ever had this bright idea that insurers, for-profit insurance insurers will um, be more efficient? How do you make a profit? My father was in the coffee business. He made a profit by providing better quality coffee at a lower cost. When capitalism works, it does it by providing um, surplus value incentives that align with use value. So my father providing better quality coffee aligned with people's desire for better quality coffee at a lower price. That's not how you make a profit in insurance. Most, your, most of your spending as a health insurer um, goes to a few people. That's why people buy insurance because they may encounter some terrible event. You know, 70% of your spending goes to 10% of the people. So how do you increase your profits? You find those 10% and you get rid of them. Adverse selection. Economists should understand this and I shouldn't have to tell it to them all the time. Lemon dropping is what the insurance industry calls it. You find the lemons, the 10% who are going to be expensive and you get them to go away. I mean, 
Yeah, you probably don't want them to die, but if they do die, that works. And you pick the cherries. You go recruiting the young, healthy people. You know, the 20-year-olds, the 30-year-olds, the people who hardly ever go to the doctor at all unless they get hit by a car or have a snowboarding accident or something like that. Yeah, those people, those are in the 50% of the population who basically did not use healthcare last year. You want those people. Insurance companies spend a lot of energy and a lot of resources identifying the cherries and the lemons, strategizing how to attract the cherries, how to drive away the lemons. And now if you don't, let's say you're a nice guy, you're a good insurance company, good that is good for people, providing use value. What happens is you're going to experience rising coverage costs. You'll have to raise premiums. When you raise premiums, Ah, the relatively healthy people will opt out. They'll go to some other company. Competition. They can go to some other company. A company with more cherries and fewer lemons. So you will have a pool that is increasingly dominated by the lemons. And you have to raise your coverage costs, raise premiums. The healthy will drop out. Competition destroys health insurance markets because competition will lead all the companies to compete to get the cherries and drive away the lemons. Um, one way to do it is with growing complexity. Um, you know, this, <laughs> this is from a book for insurance companies of the steps in processing a simple payment. 15% or so of the cost of, uh, sorry, 16% of the cost of running an American private health insurance company goes to administrative expense. By contrast, for the public health insurance company, Medicare, 1.6% goes. And that's not including the private sector of Medicare. Um, ignoring market monopoly power and market rents, economists have contributed to rising costs of health care. Yeah, they, they've allowed this concentration of market power in a handful of hospitals. Um, and we allow prices for prescription drugs to soar. The most profitable sector in the US economy over consistently over the last 30, 30 odd years is pharmaceuticals. Um, is the price of diabetes, insulin medication. Any of you know where insulin was developed, how it came to be? Insulin was developed by a Canadian chemist and he, was, he gave it to the world. He charged $1 and he gave it to the University of Toronto on condition that the University of Toronto would let anybody have the prescription, uh, the, you know, the chemistry of artificial insulin. Frederick Bunting. Um, it's like Jonas Salk developed the Salk vaccine and gave it to the world and said, nobody should profit from stopping polio. This is something the whole world needs. By contrast, and I'm not going to be mean about it, Pfizer and Moderna, how much money are they making on their vaccines? My neighbor's daughter works for Moderna. And uh, my other neighbor up there, uh, she works for a Swiss company that uh, um, is part of the Pfizer group. <laughs> you know, so I have to whisper about this. Oh, my neighbor is so proud of her daughter as well. She should be. I mean, the, these vaccines are miracle drugs. Um, but oh, who paid for them? Who paid for them? The German government, the U.S. government? And it's like, did Moderna actually pay for the development of Moderna? I mean, the U.S. pumped so much money so fast into this. And the Germans and the Europeans pumped so much money into Pfizer. And the U.S. pumped money into Pfizer also. Oh, Pfizer! Who were the chemists who had the great breakthrough? Turkish immigrants in Germany. Tell that to the to the. Uh, party for Deutschland or whatever it is. Okay. Anyway, onward. Uh, 
Eighteen percent of Americans report they skipped a dose or did not fill a prescription because, of course, this is the result of what the economists have been saying. Oh, raise copays, raise deductibles, so people won't abuse health care. Well, why America? Why is our life expectancy falling? Why do we do worse than everybody else? Because people can't afford their drugs, and insurers. Every now and then an insurance company will try to resist the high prices charged by um, a company like Mass General. And what happens? How do you how do you resist prices? Now, when Medicare goes to Mass General, Medicare says, if you don't lower prices, then we won't allow Medicare people to go to your hospital. And Mass General says, oh, well, Medicare is so big that Mass General has to give in. But insurance market competition means that all the insurance companies are relatively small. So they're relatively weak against Mass General or against Pfizer. So what do they do? Well, they say, well, we won't let any of our people go to your hospital or or buy your drugs or whatever. And then every time you do that, you're disrupting the care provide that patients need. So it just makes healthcare worse. Um, Utilization management, paperwork and forms. And here's one of my favorite slides. This is the paperwork for, um, I, uh, I had some foot problem. At this point, I can't even remember what it was. Um, and I needed physical therapy. I had to sign my name 11 times. <laughs> Look at all this paperwork. And this is just my paperwork. My doctor, the physical therapist, the guy who did the x-ray, they all had to fill out paperwork. Reams and reams of paperwork. Whatever happened to the paperless office? Um, Okay, opening the economy is endogenous. Americans don't have access to health care, which many Americans, this is 33% of Americans couldn't do something that they needed to do in the healthcare sector. Um, you know, the, this is similar to the graph that I showed you earlier. Um, uh, you know, the US is doing worse than other countries. We have Americans have more chronic conditions. Why do we have more chronic conditions? Americans are younger than people in most of these other countries. Um, we're filled with immigrants who are very healthy compared to the native born population. Um, we don't treat people right in this country. And when you don't treat people right, they get sick more and they don't recover as well. Um, Has there been a time when a family member died after not receiving treatment? 20% of blacks and even people with a family income of over 100,000 report that nearly 10% of them know somebody who died after not receiving condition because they couldn't afford to pay for it. Um, Life expectancy for women, for the 40% of women who are the poorest has been declining um, over the last 20 years. And life expectancy for men, for poorer men has not been doing as well as for richer men. But also these numbers are a little bit old In the last couple of years, life expectancy, as I said, has been falling for men as well. Um, Note also that the five-year gain in life expectancy for men, for the richest men, that's not impressive. That's only about the average. So even the wealthiest American men have not done any better than the average for people in the rest of the OECD. Um, This is my wife's favorite slide. The U.S. is becoming a failed state. You drive on our roads, they're decaying. Um, Our productivity has been growing at a relatively slow rate. And part of that is because productivity depends on health. People don't trust each other as much in the United States as they used to. And people are not in as good health as they should be. Um, Health is an economic asset. 
If you go from the preventable years of lives lost, which is calculation of the number of years per population that um, sh people should have lived longer, but they didn't because they had some condition that could have been treated, but wasn't. Um, you go from the United States down to Germany, which is about the average for the OECD. The U.S. has the highest number of preventable years of lives lost of any affluent country in the OECD. You go down to Germany, you get a 10% increase in labor productivity. Mental illness is higher in countries with higher levels of inequality um, and, I might add, worse health care systems. Um, educational scores are higher in more equal countries. Again, the United States would do relatively badly in this. Healthier workers are more efficient. Here's the preventable years of life lost. Um, GDP per hour worked is lower in countries. The U.S. is far out there. The U.S. has the highest preventable years of lives lost for men and for women. Um, Germany is about the average. And, um, you know, the, uh, if, if we had fewer preventable years of lives lost, we'd have higher labor productivity, more or less. Lost lives of economic waste. We had 250,000, approximately 250,000 extra dead Americans before COVID. 70,000 is the low number that only takes account of those who did not have health insurance. 250,000 takes account of those who have health insurance but could not get health care because of cost. Um, funerals, absentee days from work, late days from work, emotional stress, mental health problems, persistent undertreated illnesses, all of these lower economic productivity make us a poorer countries. Yeah. Um, Japan. What do the Japanese do? That's, you know, why do the Japanese live so long? I don't know. Social solidarity is a good thing. It raises productivity by lowering transactions costs and producing healthier workers and higher human capital. Treat people right and they will behave better. Stress makes people sick and inefficient. Bad treatment causes crime. Um, children grow up better in more equal societies, in societies with better health care. Um, <laughs> here's different states in the United States, health and social problems. Um, I'm afraid New York does, uh, you know, relatively well, given its high level of inequality. New York now has the highest level of inequality. Well, I guess all those rich people. Uh, bottom line, don't listen to the economists. Narrow focus on market incentives undermines health policy, makes us worse off, leads to higher inequality in income and health, undermines social solidarity, undermines economic efficiency, and kills economists kill. Ooh, that's quite a conclusion. Um, anyway, thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for your beautiful presentation. I see that Dr. Khan is with us uh, and I'm very excited about <laughs> possibility of discussion between Dr. Khan and uh, Friedman about the subjects. I think we are going gonna witness this discussion today. Uh, welcome, Dr. Khan. Thank you, thank you very much. A real pleasure to be here. I, but you know, I I don't know. I I am not. I am a student of Dr. Friedman. I am not going to start. <laughs> but uh, it is it's um, it's really it goes uh, goes to the heart. I was looking yesterday at uh, how the Nobel Prize winners were attacking him and so on. So I said, oh, this is a man after my own heart. <laughs> so, but it's amazing, you know, it's amazing. My, uh, I tell you, um, uh, of course, I, 
uh, I, I take all his points about reading and reading carefully and interpreting and then the arrow paper. I mean, I take all of that and I, it's empirically based and so on. But I give you, if you'll forgive me, just an anecdote. My grandchildren are having a pinworm disease of some kind. And my daughter is a doctor in the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, her husband is, uh, is an um, eye surgeon. So they are doing okay. And for the youngest grandchildren to get a, uh, the medicine, each tablet, it's unbelievable. Each tablet is $500. $500. And my daughter, who is okay financially and so on, she says, you know, the child is suffering. I cannot stop it. So she's hiding the fact that she's buying these pills from her husband. Because she says, uh, Jerome says, you know, it's too expensive. Why don't we get some alternative? And she said, but there is no alternative. Now, as it happened, I took, uh, there was a conference in Michigan State. So I uh, drove to East Lansing two weeks, about 10 days ago. I stopped in my granddaughter's place. She said to my graduate student who accompanied me on the drive, you are going to India. Can you get it for me? And how much will it cost? And he said, of course, I'll get it for you. My daughter was scared. He said, would it be inappropriate to ask him? I said, no, no, he's been volunteering. Apparently, they distribute those pills free in India. They distribute those pills free in India. And he said, it costs ten dollars for me to get you a whole strip so she said oh you mean ten dollars for a pill he said no ten dollars for ten pills and I, I i suddenly say you know and i teach i've been teaching since 1973 the fundamental theorems of welfare economics <laughs> and i i you see it's a problem it's a problem i mean in some sense um, uh, yeah, I, nothing more, nothing more. I, I just, I, I'm, really, I'm really glad your grandchildren can get access and you yes. know, could afford it even if they couldn't get it from India. Indeed, indeed. I'm really glad. But, you know, there are lots of people who obviously can't and they'll grow up disabled or won't grow up at all. Um, I have a graduate student who um, mentioned to me that... Uh, when she was 15, she came down with a deadly disease, genetic disorder, um, and she takes four pills a day. Back then, they cost $5 each. So, okay, that's $7,000. Uh, but a company bought up the uh, production, and they now, they're now about $250 a pill or $1,000 a day. Um, I looked up the, you know, I eventually figured out what disease she has from her description of the symptoms and I and figured out the medicine, medicine. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a drug that was developed 60 years ago. It's off patent, but it's a very small batch because not a whole lot of people have this thing, Wilson's disease. So um, one company makes them and nobody else bothers going into the market. It's too small a market. So they charge those prices. We have, um, uh, we sometimes have the opportunity to uh, buy drugs from Canada, but uh, it's technically it's illegal to import human drugs to the United States. So uh, I didn't hear what you said about your graduate student going to India. <laughs> uh, indeed, indeed. Yes. I shows you my outrage is now going against my instinct for self-preservation. <laughs> I may be yeah, present. yeah, yeah. Oh my God, this is going on YouTube. You know, the FBI <laughs> yes. is going to come after both of us. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, but it's it's an outrageous. Uh, situation. And you know, the Trump administration, the Council of Economic Advisors under Trump acknowledged the problem of or the issue of high U.S. drug prices. Their solution was the U.S. should enforce its intellectual property laws outside to make everybody else pay prices as high as we do. 
<laughs> the problem isn't that Americans pay twice the price for drugs that people do in other countries, but other countries' prices should be raised. And we should go after India and other countries that are um, you know, undercutting U.S. Uh, drug prices. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's use the U.S. Navy to uh, drive up uh, you know, uh, world drug prices you know, so that everybody will suffer the way Americans do. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming. See, Good to see, see you, you, Dr. Khan. Thank you. Uh, yes. We would like to yeah. guest you in 4th of this, uh, November. Uh, <laughs> dear participants, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can uh, ask uh, one sure. question. So uh, thanks a lot, Professor Friedman, for this uh, really interesting and uh, fun talk. I really Thank enjoyed you. it a lot. Uh, so once you started talking about the 10% that the insurance companies were trying to get rid of, that kind of made me wonder. So then COVID-19, you know, the virus was really uh, made the older guys vulnerable. So they, 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 there were a lot of deaths in this age group. So yeah. that it's uh, made them made their profits even higher than is it uh, the case? It has. Um, and this is I was totally wrong. Um, back in the spring of 2020, I was going around telling everybody, oh, the, the insurance companies are all going to be in trouble because businesses are laying off workers. So the insurance companies are getting fewer payment, fewer um uh, you know, payments in, but they're going to be sending more people to hospitals, whatever, so they'll be paying more out. So the insurance companies will be in trouble. Well, in fact, the insurance companies have done very, very well because people were scared to go to the doctor for fear of getting COVID, weren't going into the hospitals because hospitals had canceled elective surgery. Um, and I'll get to the politics in a minute. Um, hospitals had canceled elective surgery. Um, so they were spending less. And the federal government came in to buy people health insurance, the old health insurance, make the payments for the old health insurance. So they were continuing to get the money coming in. So the insurance companies have done great. And like you say, their most expensive people have died relatively quick diseases. Um, you know, you get cancer, it could go on for years before you die. If you're going to die of COVID, you probably will do it within a few weeks. And since there's virtually no treatment, the treatments are coming along, but there's very little treatment. Um, you know, you just go into the hospital and there's not much they do. They send, they might even just, you know, people often just die at home. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been, uh, <laughs> it's been great for the insurance industry. Um, the hospitals have also done very well because the hospitals got this gigantic bailout from the federal government because the federal government expected, oh my God, the hospitals will be in trouble. So they got all this money. And then it turns out that, you know, they, okay, they're not doing the elective surgery, but eh, they're getting people in for some other purposes for COVID. So, um, and they've cut back on nursing staff. Uh, so, uh, it's, you know, it's amazing how <laughs> capitalism is so flexible. Capital is able to make money from everything, you know. Um, but, okay, uh, the political possibilities in the United States, it's an uphill battle for sure. And it's one that's been going on for a long time. Um, the other day, I addressed a group of the so-called Progressive Democrats of America. Um, and I produced a slide showing cam campaign contributions by industry, campaign and lobbying contributions by industry. The number one industry in the country by far in campaign and lobbying spending, pharmaceuticals, $200 million last year spent in lobbying and campaign contributions. By contrast, the military industrial complex, you know, aerospace, defense, the bad guys that 
you know, some of us grew up thinking, oh, these are the enemy. <laughs> They're not even in the top 10, you know, like $40 million. You know. um, number two, health insurers. Uh, number four, hospitals. So, you know, it's a real issue. Now, as it happened, um, the reaction against Trump was so strong that, um, you know, it pulled the Democratic Party far, far to the left. Things that I was saying in 2016 that um, Dr. Khan brought up, you know, drew a lot of attacks are now mainstream ideas about fiscal policy, um, a restoration of Keynesian approaches, demand management, um, and national health insurance. So the economists around Biden are way to the, I mean, you know, one of them, you know, applied to our graduate school, we turned her down, but you know, she went to the new school. And another one is an old friend of the department talking about the people in the Council of Economic Advisors. So, um, you know, the politics have moved substantially to the left, uh, but it's still an uphill battle because um, the, uh, there is so much profit in the current system. So the approach has been to chip away at it. Um, lower the, Biden has wanted to lower the age that people can start getting Medicare, expand um, you know, the Medicaid program to take in more people. Um, so this is not going to undermine, you know, that you'll still be able to make a lot of money, maybe just not quite as much money. Um, but you've got an industry, the health insurance industry is worth, you know, the top 10 companies are worth over $2 trillion. The drug companies are worth over, the top five drug companies are worth something like five trillion dollars so uh sorry the top 10 drug companies are worth five trillion dollars so there's there's a lot of wealth there and if we actually get to a point of of uh bringing in national health insurance in a real way then all that wealth is going to go away and like i said a lot of the in many states the biggest employer now is a hospital network like in massachusetts so people are worried about their jobs. And, you know, a lot of people, uh, people I addressed a couple of years ago, I addressed the association of the heads of research and teaching hospitals. And I walk in there and it occurred to me, there's nobody in this room who makes less than a million dollars, I bet, <laughs> yeah, except for me. <laughs> um, all those people, they're nice people. They care about patients, but they also have a, a huge vested interest in the current system. And overcoming that is going to take quite, um, quite a popular movement. It's happened. You know, um, the most, unfortunately, I think the most relevant comparison would be with the movement that ended slavery. Um, the abolition and emancipation movement, which I'll be teaching about in later this morning. Um, and abolition and emancipation, you know how it ended. Um, slavery was ended in the United States and it was the largest uncompensated confiscation of property in history. Uh, the slave owners got nothing. Uh, the British slave owners were compensated. The French slave owners were compensated. The French were compensated for the Haitian rebellion. The French managed to force Haiti, where there's a successful slaveholders, a slave, a slave, slave rebellion. The French were able to force Haiti to make payments. But in the United States, the slave owners got nothing. Um, and a million Americans died out of a third population of 30 million during that war. Uh, so, you know, ending health insurance as we know it would be a huge loss of value for capitalists. And I don't know how 
well, <laughs> how, how we'll actually get that done. But we're a democracy still, so it's conceivable, I guess. Yeah. There's one more question in chat box from Robert. Oh. Oh, um, yeah, the uh, politically possible, yeah. Why do the voters elect politicians who oppose universal health care? Oh, God. Why do Americans vote the way they do? Uh, I think most people don't vote on issues of health insurance, health care. They vote on other issues because most people are healthy. Um, you know, and the relatively small population, 10%, 20% who are really unhealthy, um, they may vote on health. They, they may care a lot about health insurance, um, but people, have lots of other issues. Um, you know, uh, I care about health insurance. I also would like to end our imperialist wars. I also care about civil rights, women's rights. So I get these moderate democratic politicians who come in and, oh, and most of all, I want to make sure that Trump doesn't come back to power. You know, so, um, you know, I happily voted for Joe Biden because he was the guy running against Trump. Um, you know, the uh, and while I you know, supported Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, I didn't mind that Biden won the nomination because I was afraid that Bernie or Warren would lose an election to Biden. Most Democrats turned to support Biden because they thought he could win. Um, and he did not by a lot. So it does make you wonder whether, you know, we could have won with somebody else. So, uh, and then of course there's racism, you know, the working class in the United States has become, a, you know, the major support for, for far right nationalist xenophobic politics. Um, you know, uh, I think, I don't know, I, this paper that I, I'm just publishing, I think people, um, working people in the United States have decided that the uh, Democrats are not going to deliver for the working people. So they'll just vote their anger. They know that the Republicans and Trump are not going to do anything good for them, but at least he'll beat up on the foreigners and the Muslims and blacks and Jews and whatever. Yeah. So I don't know. It's a, it's a great question. It's fundamental. Yeah. Ibrahim. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for lovely talk. Uh, your solution is actually a decommodification and I'm just agree with you. I agree with you. Dem yeah, dem decommodification as far as possible uh, right now. <laughs> And I don't know the boundaries yet, uh, if it's possible to, uh, if, if, whether it's possible to uh, the, the private property yet. But the, the issue is about the commodification, I'm with you. Uh, and I, I just want to make a small comment over Turkey uh, in here. Mm -hmm. In Turkey, we are lucky that uh, public sector, public health care sector still dominates uh, private sector. Uh, but there's this issue, uh, the number of doctors uh, and nurses and other staff are per person are very limited in Turkey. So uh, in the last few decades, we see that uh, there's a stratification uh, over health care system, uh, over health care system uh, beneficiaries. For example, if you're if you're uh, upper class or if you're upper middle class or upper class customer, then you choose uh, the best hospitals. There's this mix. Uh, there's I guess there's some uh, public sector maybe it's uh, sixty percent or more, but there's this uh, small uh, maybe twenty percent uh, private sector in healthcare. And there's solid certification over there. For example, if you're a bit rich, uh, you you probably 
choose acı badem over other uh, health care providers. This huge litigation over there. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a lot. Yes, yes, absolutely. And this happens everywhere. You know, we're not going to end um, you know, privilege for uh, wealthier people, people who have inherit more money or somehow get more money. Um, in the British system, they have the National Health Service, which is very efficient and very high quality. Um, of course, you know, it's staffed by Turks. So of course it's a good system. Um, Turkish and Pakistani immigrants. Uh, but there's also the private sector and the rich go to you know, pay out of pocket for um, the privilege and you know of private sector. It's I I have mixed feelings. Um, you know, on the one hand, yeah, it does worry me that people would be um you're jumping the queue in effect. If we had a public system that was good and people were still jumping to get better quality faster. On the other hand, it's also important that there be an option for people that if you um, have some particular need or you feel like you're not going to be, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you're not treated right then you need to have a private option. So as long as the as long as the floor is very high, it doesn't worry me so much if some people go above it. Um, the important thing is that everybody should have really good health care. <laughs> you know, we should decommodify um, you know, good, really good quality health care, really good quality uh, education, really good quality housing. And, you know, some people are still going to have a mansion. Some people are still going to go to private schools and some people will still go to private hospitals. Yeah. And, you know, we'll just have to live with it. Uh, okay. We would like to thank Mr. Friedman, Dr. Friedman again. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It was me. a very beneficial presentation and discussion for us. Uh, I also thanks to uh, participants for their contribution. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any question, uh, let's end the meeting. And uh, we hope to see you uh, in 4th of November. It's Dr. Khan. <laughs> I'm sure hoping to get to uh, uh, Istanbul soon. <laughs> And I'll see you before that. Thank you. Thank you bye very bye. much, Professor. You're Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.